Welcome back, friends. Um, thanks for being here today. I want to say two quick things first. Please be sure to stay until the very end of the video for a special announcement. And second, I apologize that this video took so long. Um, back in November, the Patreon family graciously allowed me to cover this case in place of their poll for National Native American Heritage Month. That deadline has obviously passed, but this case and what it represents is not just important one month of the year, it's an ongoing problem. One that I wanted to give my best effort to, which is partly what delayed it. The other delay was my move, which I underestimated the scope of, the packing, the downsizing. Um, we had to move up four flights of stairs, which is two of us, among other setbacks, which don't really matter. The point is, I promised you a video a certain time, and I didn't deliver that. And for that, I am sorry. And thank you to my patrons for understanding, and to all of you who have stuck around. The move is over. There won't be another one for several years, thank goodness. So I can now dive back into these cases. Um, this one's been on my mind for a while, and I'm sure by the end of it, you'll understand why. I hope I do the issue and Ashley justice. Ashley, we love you and we want you home. Authorities and family in Glacier County are continuing to search for a missing woman from Browning. And I remember him saying that particular piece that, you know, if you want to get away with murder, go to Browning, Montana. It's six months since Ashley Loring Heavy Runner was last seen on the Blackfeet Reservation. The FBI said the Bureau of Indian Affairs requested their help to find Ashley. I just wish things could have turned out differently for my sister. Bring Ashley home! What happened to Ashley is a tragedy. No one would ever want to have that happen in their family. Somebody should come forward right now because we want Ashley home. I first heard of Ashley Loring Heavy Runner's case sometime earlier this year, but I was working on another case at the time, so I didn't dig any deeper. However, I kept thinking about Ashley a member of the Blackfeet tribe last seen on the reservation in June of 2017. Her sister was desperately searching for answers, and the case lacked any in-depth investigation on law enforcement's part. What I didn't realize was Ashley's case was just one example of a bigger problem. The rates of violence, unsolved disappearances and murders, and lack of justice for the Native American communities is a massive epidemic. Out of the 326 reservations in the United States, 310 of them have crime rates two and a half times higher than the national average. Ashley, unfortunately, is one of many victims, but she has become the face of a movement seeking justice for missing and murdered Native American women. Despite this, her case remains unsolved. So today on Dark Matters, the disappearance of Ashley Loring Heavy Runner. Born November 23, 1996, Ashley Mariah Loring Heavy Runner was, by all accounts, well-loved. She was described as funny, hardworking, intelligent, outgoing, and feisty, but not a troublemaker. Ashley had the personality to succeed, but her childhood wasn't exactly smooth sailing. She and her older sister, Kimberly Loring, entered foster care due to their mother's struggle with substance abuse. And during this difficult time, Kimberly promised Ashley that they would always stay together, and she would always find her if they were ever separated. Luckily, they ended up with their grandparents on a horse ranch just outside of Hart Butte, and keeping that promise became easier. This seemed like a happy time for the Loring family. 
The girls and their other siblings learned to ride and care for the horses, chopped wood for the stove, and swam in a nearby creek, all the while forming a strong family bond. Ashley was the so-called keeper of family photos and constantly carried a camera around to capture cherished moments. During high school, she played volleyball and ran cross-country before graduating in 2015 with plans to attend Blackfeet Community College, located on the reservation. But unfortunately, not all of her future plans came to fruition. After attending Blackfeet Community College in Browning for a couple of years, in June of 2017, Ashley decided to transfer to the University of Montana to study environmental sciences. As a member of the Blackfeet Nation, Ashley wanted to arm herself with the knowledge to care for the land. Kimberly already lived in an apartment in Missoula, about a four-hour drive from the reservation, and had a job working with senior citizens. Ashley planned to move in with Kimberly in June of 2017 to settle in before the fall semester. June 6th, Kimberly gets a call from Ashley while in Morocco on vacation. They discuss her return date to coordinate Ashley's move into the apartment, a prospect that excited Kimberly since she hadn't seen her younger sister since the previous winter. June 8th, Kimberly's plane lands back in Montana, and upon deboarding, the first thing she does is call Ashley, but there's no answer, to calls or text messages. At first, this doesn't alarm Kimberly, Ashley misplaced her phone fairly often, but after a couple of days of being home and multiple failed attempts to get a hold of her, Kimberly's worry takes her to Facebook, asking if anyone had seen her. Facebook friends had a lot to say about Ashley, but none of it exactly alleviated Kimberly's nerves. Um, first, they claimed Ashley was at a party on the reservation in the evening of June 5th, which was the day before she called Kimberly, something reportedly confirmed by a Facebook video. Now. I couldn't find this supposed video, and I'm unsure the context in which it confirmed her presence at this party, and um, to add to the confusion, there are conflicting disappearance dates. First it was reported that she was last seen on the 5th in either Browning or St. Mary. Um, the Charlie Project still currently has her listed as missing on this day in Browning. Then later reports said she vanished on the 7th, and even later reports from October 2017 say that she was last seen at a bank in Browning on the 13th, the same date that the FBI is giving for her disappearance. Regardless, Kimberly still couldn't find her little sister, which made the second thing she found out all the more alarming. On June 7th, the day before Kimberly returned home, Ashley reportedly messaged several of her Facebook friends that she hadn't spoken to in a long while, out of the blue, asking for a ride home. One person that responded couldn't pick Ashley up, but asked her what was going on and got no response. Others told Kimberly that Ashley was harmed and taken to the mountains, but there's really no way to substantiate that claim, and reportedly some people even got defensive when Kimberly questioned them. And the last login from Ashley's Facebook profile was the 8th, which was a day after she was asking for a ride home. One week passes, and in addition to not being able to find her missing sister, Kimberly and Ashley's father is hospitalized in Great Falls for a liver condition. Kimberly's repeated attempts to find Ashley turn up nothing, and no one in Browning, which sits at the center of the reservation, is talking. With just over 1,000 residents, it's normally a community that talks in the wake of tragedy, but according to Kimberly, the town has been strangely silent, a silence echoed by her absent sister. Ashley reportedly wasn't the type to keep her family in the dark or to cease contact, so Kimberly went to the police to report her missing. However, the comfort we might feel when law enforcement takes on a case is far from what reservation residents feel. In place of relief is often pure frustration followed by outrage.
At first, when Kimberly contacts tribal police to report her sister missing, they tell her that Ashley's an adult. She's legally allowed to go incommunicado. They still take the report, but they don't take it seriously, according to the Loring family. Blackfeet Law Enforcement Services stated that they'd formed a task force to search for Ashley and searched the north, south, and west parts of the reservation, including the Bab St. Mary area. And while that may be true, Kimberly emphasized the lack of initial action. There was no BOLA alert broadcast nationwide, and the case eventually landed in the lap of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, where it was headed by Special Agent Kyle Sinclair, with little progress. Nine months later, her disappearance sat frozen with no updates to propel the case further. Unfortunately, this lack of answers is grotesquely common for families of missing and murdered indigenous women. For far too long, the stories of missing and murdered indigenous women have gone unheard. And we know the facts, and they are startling. We have an epidemic on our hands. Far too many native women have experienced violence, and that must change. First, let's talk about some numbers, because this is a complex issue, and I'm not claiming to be an expert by any means, but I think this research still warrants your attention. Native American and Alaskan Native women make up 0.7%, or 633 cases of missing persons in the FBI's National Crime Information Center database, despite only making up 0.4% of the population. That's a 0.3% difference. In 2017, the Department of Justice found that out of Montana's 72 missing person cases, 22 of them, or 30% of them were comprised of Native American women and girls who actually only make up 3.3% of the state's population. If they were to be proportionally represented, there would be only two cases, not 22. And for a more focused look at the consequences of these numbers, Sadie Youngbird, executive director of the Fort Berthold Coalition Against Violence, said in just one and a half years, she's had five cases of murdered or missing women, resulting in 18 motherless children. That's just five cases. So think about the implications on a larger scale, which is what we're dealing with, especially considering experts say that the problem is much greater than these statistics can even convey. As U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota says, cases are often underreported and data isn't officially collected. A report by the National Crime Information Center places the number much higher than the FBI's database at 5,712 cases of Native American women reported missing. And again, that's the reported cases. According to Heitkamp, this epidemic is the result of inadequate resources, indifference, and a, quote, confusing jurisdictional maze. And all of that doesn't even include Canada's First Nation populations. A report by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in 2016 concerning unresolved missing persons and murders of Indigenous women between the year 1980 to 2012 came back with 1,181 cases, which, according to Anita Lucchese, might also be grossly underestimated. She found an additional 400 to 500 cases that Canada's governmental inquiry actually missed. Lucchese carries many titles, doctoral student at the University of Lethbridge in Canada, member of the Southern Cheyenne tribe, a survivor of domestic violence, and cartographer. The latter three led her to compile online reports and public records for her Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women database, which contains over 2,500 unsolved cases, many of which aren't listed in the other databases we've previously mentioned. Part of the reason that I do this work is because I was almost one of these women. I experienced domestic violence um, that threatened my life. None of the lists match. None of them are updated frequently. None of them are very thorough. None of them include both countries. Lucchese also happened to be 
one of Ashley's teachers at Blackfeet Community College and tragically had to add her own ex-student to her database among the average 200 to 300 other cases she adds per year. She estimates since the early 1900s, there could be as many as 20,000 unsolved, undocumented cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Unfortunately, it's hard to recover anything before 1990 due to poor record keeping. When it comes to Ashley's case, insufficient law enforcement training and resources, and jurisdictional problems all seem to be at play. There was no progress despite Blackfeet Law Enforcement Services enlisting the Bureau of Indian Affairs for help. Carl Kipp, chairman of the Blackfeet's Law and Order Committee and a member of the Blackfeet Tribal Business Council, which is the reservation's governing body, said tribal police are stretched, quote, pretty thin, something that's led to decades of unsolved and unprosecuted crimes on the reservation, including Ashley's. So my question was, how thinly stretched are the tribal police and other law enforcement agencies on reservations? For the Blackfeet Nation, Blackfeet Law Enforcement Services and the Bureau of Indian Affairs have four sergeants and 15 officers to cover about 1.5 million acres of land, which is larger than the state of Delaware. Kip estimates a minimum of 30 officers would actually be needed to sufficiently patrol that acreage, but low funding ensures that they are undertrained and understaffed at all times. In addition, different laws like whether or not crimes are committed on or off the reservation, or if the tribal member is a victim or a perp, tie their hands. They cannot sentence someone looking at being convicted for a sentence of longer than three years in prison, which means many, if not most, major crimes go to the federal level. The U.S. Department of Justice is responsible for prosecuting felonies such as kidnapping, rape, and murder on reservation land, but that doesn't mean those issues actually get resolved. In 2011, federal prosecutors declined to file charges in 52% of cases involving the most serious of crimes on reservations, declining 65% of rape charges and 61% of the cases of sexual abuse to children. In comparison, they turned down 20% of their nationwide drug trafficking cases. So, if tribal members can't prosecute and the federal prosecutors reject it, how is justice served? How are predators and perpetrators punished? Remember, I only have a surface level knowledge of this whole issue, but from what I can tell, these cases are kind of left in limbo. According to Jerry Gardner, a member of the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, which helps develop justice programs on reservations, after rejecting said cases, prosecutors rarely deliver relevant evidence back to tribal courts. They neglect to tell tribal members why they are not proceeding with their cases and Often, by the time tribal law enforcement actually finds this out, the statute of limitations has run out. The silence on Fed's ends also makes communities feel as though there's no progress being made on these cases. So this is essentially the victim's side. Something horrible happens to you or someone you love. You can't go through local court systems, the case is sent to the feds, and months pass with no word before you find out it's been rejected a while ago, but it's past the statute of limitations to do even minimally about it. It's infuriating to even think about, but let's take a moment and swivel our lens to the Department of Justice. What encompasses their decision to prosecute or not? Prosecutors say that they turn down many cases due to a lack of admissible evidence, which makes sense, but is definitely not always the situation. For example, a 13-year-old girl was sexually assaulted by a 31-year-old man, and authorities had a DNA match, statements from relatives who not only saw but interrupted the act, and no charges were filed by federal prosecutors. 
Tribal courts could legally only sentence him to a year in jail at the time, and that's one example. But based on the rate of 52% rejections in one year, are we to believe that it is the exception? How many other cases with permissible and solid evidence are being passed over? And why the lack of communication with tribes? The DOJ claims that they are limited with the information that they can disclose on the chance that cases could reopen at a later date. As for why evidence often never makes its way back to tribal courts, Assistant United States Attorney in Wyoming Carrie J. Jacobson said, We can't turn over our evidence while we are doing our investigation, and I don't want victims of sexual assault to have to testify twice. Now, in my personal opinion, and I want to emphasize that this is my opinion, considering the low rate at which they get the chance to testify at all, this kind of seems like a weak point. But I am not a victim of sexual assault, I have not been through the trial processes, so I can't speak for someone who's in that position. Um, I can imagine it's incredibly painful to do even once. Former federal prosecutor from North Dakota, Tim Purden, seems to understand, or at least take seriously, how big of an issue this is. He describes the justice system on reservations as a jurisdictional thicket, a labyrinth which gets even more complicated for missing persons cases. Purden said, Where do I go to file a missing persons report? Do I go to tribal police, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the FBI? They might want to help, but a missing person case without more is not a crime, so they may not be able to open an investigation. Do I go to one of the county sheriffs? If that sounds like a horribly complicated mishmash, that would tremendously complicate it how I would try to find help, it's because that's what it is. And all of that, again, means unsolved, unprosecuted crimes, and a lack of resources for those with missing loved ones on reservations. I understand that this is a widely complicated problem, and I'm just scratching the surface, but now that you sort of have the basics of the issue, I think it's easier to see the expanse of the problem, and through that lens, view Ashley's case as immensely important, yes, but far from the only case where complications can hinder the investigation. The Bureau of Indian Affairs told ABC News that law enforcement conducted 55 interviews and 38 searches for Ashley Loring Heavy Runner. Spokesperson Nidra Darling claimed that they'd even identified several suspects and persons of interest, but that information has never been publicly released. Law enforcement has also offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest, six months after Ashley was reported missing. For Kimberly, those efforts are tainted by the initial reaction to her sister's disappearance. She said, The only good thing that came out of the BIA was that they'd helped with the reward money. We are thankful for that. I think if they would have taken it seriously at the beginning, we could have found more info and could maybe even have found my sister. So, in the lack of an official effort, who's been looking for Ashley? That weight has largely fallen upon Kimberly's shoulders, heading all efforts with the aid of other members of the Loring family, friends, and several community residents. After Ashley's disappearance, Kimberly actually moved back in with her grandmother and eventually left her job in Missoula to search full-time, often by herself. She looked for clues on social media, put up flyers, fundraised for search parties, and followed anonymous tips to their end, no matter how strange or painful they were to explore. For Kimberly, it seems taking things into her own hands was the only option. Kimberly, her Aunt Lissa, friends, and volunteers have logged well around 100 searches at this point, even with 1.5 million acres to cover, wandering into dangerous territory, using maps to navigate around closed roads, going door to door, avoiding poisonous snakes, enduring snow, storms, downpours, slogging through mud, and getting a little too close to bears and mountain lions but nothing has discouraged them. 
Family found a gray sweatshirt that matched Ashley's last known clothing description in a dump in the Bab area, in addition to a pair of boots. Kimberly says that they turned the items over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and two weeks passed with no word from the Bureau, and when Kimberly contacted them to find out what was going on, they told her they'd lost the sweater and didn't know where it was. Near an abandoned trailer where Ashley's cousin had previously resided, and allegedly one of the last places Ashley was seen, family found several bones in July of 2017. Five police cars responded to the discovery, but the bones were too large to be human, leaving family both relieved and frustrated. As the winter drew near, the first major snowfall hinders and eventually halts searches in the Rocky Mountains, and family is forced to wait until spring to continue scouring the vast wilderness of the reservation. But even threats that Kimberly would end up like her sister if she continued to dig deeper never deterred her from keeping the promise she made to Ashley so many years ago. From June 2017 until February 2018, Ashley's case fell under the authority of tribal police and then the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In March 2018, the FBI announced it would be taking over, quote, at the request of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The federal attention seemed like a hopeful step forward, but why did the Bureau wait so long to ask the FBI to take over the case? We have evidence that the FBI knew of Ashley's case as early as October of 2017. FBI spokesperson Sandra Barker said the FBI was, quote, aware of the case but not involved. However, we are coordinating with appropriate authorities currently investigating the matter and we are prepared to assist if requested. Barker mentioned that a request wasn't required for them to be involved. And a month later, in November, the FBI began assisting the Bureau, who continued on as the lead agency. Barker said, quote, I think we are now involved mostly because of the length of time that she's been missing. But this still doesn't answer the question of why did the Bureau wait nine months to request the FBI take over the case. BIA spokesperson Darling said, Due to leads coming off of the reservation, the FBI took the lead of the investigation so they can follow up on those leads outside of Indian country. An explanation that not only falls short, but is flat-out contradictory, according to Kimberly, who said, I gave them the tip that she might be taken to Washington from day one. They got a tip from New Mexico around the same time. Not to mention, in October, Kimberly claimed the BIA told her that they had a lead in Great Falls, which is about 100 miles outside of the reservation, and were going there to investigate it. So, from Kimberly's account, law enforcement already had tips taking them off of the reservation early on in the investigation, but didn't enlist the Federal Bureau of Investigation until much, much later. Still, Kimberly was hopeful for this development, at least initially. We won't stop searching for Ashley, and we are relieved that the FBI is in, or that the FBI is involved because it seems like now we are getting more updates, and it seems like we are being taken serious now. We will be getting answers soon, hopefully. We just need those people with the information to come forward. By April 2018, Kimberly had created an online petition and revealed at the time that the main suspects have never been questioned by the FBI. I don't know how she knew this, if the FBI directly told her this, if she spoke with the suspects, etc. Um, it's entirely possible the FBI couldn't reveal their investigation status to her, or maybe she felt like nothing was being done um, for the lack of updates, but... If what she says is true, if she had some kind of confirmation, it doesn't exactly seem like Ashley's case is in better hands, even with the Bureau. While in the middle of researching Ashley's case, there was an update in late November, but more of a painful one than a hopeful one. On the 18th, the Loring family was made aware of a Facebook profile page using Ashley's photos under the name Megan Kelly Watson. 
The profile holder claimed to live in Manitoba, Canada, working as a barista at Starbucks. The page also contained strange comments and references concerning the poster's preference in men. Family and friends quickly reported the page to Facebook, who took it down shortly after. City News reached out to R.D. Parker Collegiate, the high school listed on the profile, to confirm that no student by the name of Megan Kelly Watson attended that school or even any in the district. They also found that the contact name is different from the profile name, and the contact name actually leads to an Instagram account of someone serving in the Canadian Armed Forces who said that they actually had someone serving under that same name as an Instagram profile, but couldn't confirm that they were connected to the services or that the entire profile itself wasn't a farce. It may be too soon to rule this out as a cruel prank, but I hope this has been or is in the process of being investigated. Ashley's aunt Lissa Loring had this to say of the stunt when speaking to City News. Grow up. Stop doing stuff like that. It's disgusting. You know, to see what my nieces, you know, her younger siblings and Kimberly went through, you know, that anger they built. It's sickening, you know, and I, I hope you never have to deal with anything that we do. And, you know, I really hope that nobody does what you did to our family. At this point, there's not enough public information to draw concrete conclusions about what happened to Ashley Loring Heavy Runner. We can only speculate, and really, because we know so little, anything is possible. So, we're going to briefly talk numbers again concerning the related issue of violence on reservations against women, and please don't misconstrue this, I am not saying that violence against Native American women is the only type of violence that matters, that someone else's experience is less or more valid because of their race, gender, or orientation. I just want you to know the prevalence of violence that exists against Native American women in case you weren't previously aware. And with the reservation law enforcement and justice system so convoluted, I think it does warrant attention. Here's what a report by the National Institute of Justice in 2016 found. Native Americans experienced violence 52% more than the general population, with 84% of Native American women experiencing violence in their lifetime. Over half of those women experience sexual assault, one-third are raped over the course of their life, and that was 730,000 women in 2015 alone. Two and a half times higher than white women, and four times higher than the national average of sexual assault and rape. Two-thirds of their assaulters are white and other non-native men who fall outside of tribal jurisdiction, according to a study done by the University of Delaware and University of North Carolina Wilmington for the U.S. Department of Justice. Remember the complications I mentioned earlier with prosecuting non-tribal members and crimes? That's due to a 1978 Supreme Court ruling prohibiting tribal authorities from arresting or prosecuting non-Native men who assault Native American women on reservations. So from there, they're sent to the federal prosecutor's responsibility, and we've talked about how that goes. According to that same study, several counties in the United States that are mainly comprised of Native American lands have murder rates of Native American women 10 times greater than the national average for any race. One of those victims was seven-year-old Monica Still Smoking, who was kidnapped from her school in Browning, Montana. Her uncle was actually the one to find her body a week later on a mountain frozen in the snow 20 miles away. No arrests have ever been made, and her killer goes unpunished. Male murder victims' perpetrators also walk free. 21-year-old Matthew Rattlesnake Grant went missing on December 15, 2016 during a winter storm and was later found in an alley in Browning on the 31st. The family still has no answers, and Matthew's son never got the chance to meet his father. As for why Native Americans, particularly women, are targets of violence, Sarah Deer, a professor at the University of Kansas and member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, says Native women are historically viewed as invisible, disposable, and vulnerable. The result of this perception, she says, made us more of a target, particularly the women who have addiction issues, PTSD, and other kind of maladies. 
You have a very marginalized group, and the legal system doesn't seem to take proactive attempts to protect Native women in some cases. Laura John, a tribal liaison for the city of Portland, adds that, quote, Offenders target reservation communities. They know if they go and commit a crime against a Native person that it's pretty easy for them to get away with it. Or, in the words of Lou Casey, Ashley's former professor, we live in a society where portrayals of indigenous women are often as victims of violence or hypersexualized. When the rest of the country only thinks of Native women in these ways, it's easy to see us in real life as women who are easy to victimize. So, I am far from the first person to bring these issues to the forefront. I want to make that clear. Um, I may be the first person you hear it from, or maybe you were already aware of it, or maybe perish the thought you've experienced or lived it yourself, but there are journalists and lawmakers bringing it to a national level of attention and implementing possible solutions or at least management policies to try and combat the violence. Hashtag Not Invisible was a social media campaign created by Senator Heidi Heitkamp to raise awareness for the issue. Um, but she and other politicians aren't just using hashtags. They are trying to make actual legal changes. Senator Heitkamp has proposed a bill titled Savannah's Act, calling for tribal law enforcement to have easier access to federal crime databases, protocols for responding to missing and murdered persons cases, and requiring the Department of Justice to respond to them. In addition, there would be a mandatory annual report of those numbers in order to detect patterns of these crimes. Unfortunately, as I learned this morning, the bill's been stalled in the House after passing unanimously in the Senate back on December 6th. House Committee Chairman Bob Goodlatte, who is retiring at the end of the year, made changes to the bill concerning its language in certain areas. The changes, according to ABC News, quote, remove stipulations that the Attorney General shall give affirmative preference to applicants for two existing DOJ grant programs from law enforcement agencies that have implemented the guidelines, in addition to striking, quote, provisions to keep law enforcement agencies accountable for implementing the bill's new requirements. Heitkamp's team has accused Goodlatt of trying to stall the bill until the end of the year, which means it will have to start back at the beginning processes at the next congressional session, where neither Heitkamp, who lost her re-election bid this year, or Goodlatte will be present. Still, several co-sponsors have vowed to ensure the bill passes next year regardless. Senator Lisa Murkowski told ABC News she, quote, committed to Heitkamp to get Savannah's act passed aggressively and early. Senator Heitkamp was also part of the End Trafficking of Native Americans Act, along with Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada. This bill would expand preventative measures against human trafficking for Native Americans and Alaska Natives. The bill was introduced to the Senate back in July, but hasn't progressed since. The SURVIVE Act looks to create tribal grant programs in the Department of Justice to assist survivors of violent crimes, including access to programs and services like rape crisis centers and domestic violence shelters. It was reported to the Senate, but hasn't been passed. And May 5th is now considered a National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women and Girls, which falls on the birthday of Hannah Harris, who was murdered on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in 2013. The Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013 partly changed the previously mentioned 1978 Supreme Court ruling. The act gives tribes who meet certain conditions particular jurisdiction in domestic violence cases involving non-native offenders. Proposals to expand the act and give tribes authority to prosecute non-natives in sex or human trafficking charges are in the works, but when the U.S. Senate voted in September of this year to keep the law in its current form for two months, it delayed those motions. Still, it's not just lawmakers that can make a difference. Kimberly very recently spoke in front of the United States Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., calling for new protocol for missing persons cases on reservations, and journalists aren't ignoring the issue either. 
AP News put out a series of articles highlighting not only Ashley's case, but the overall issue of violence towards Native American women. The series, dubbed Missing in Indian Country, brought widespread national attention to the issue, and the response was kind of staggering. It actually got the attention of the Department of Justice, who announced that they would double funding for tribes' public safety programs, totaling $113 million, and adding an additional $133 million to tribes for the victims of these violent crimes. Both funds, however, are divided between 133 tribes and Alaska Native villages. If split evenly, that would be about 850000 each for safety programs and $1 million each for victims' funds. The Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General Jesse Panuccio also stated the Department of Justice would be collaborating with tribes to assign specialized prosecutors who are knowledgeable in federal and tribal courts to handle sexual assault, domestic and dating violence, and stalking cases where other crimes were also involved. And while the funding is welcomed, Heitkamp says that there is still a long way to go before the issue can be effectively managed or resolved. For families like the Lorings, no amount of money can buy them the answers that they yearn for. Lucchese wishes things were different for her former student, who'd recently become passionate about the issues facing murdered and missing indigenous women. This is what she told KRTV News. I wish she was home safe. I wish this never happened, you know, but I take comfort in knowing that she is doing what she wanted to do. She is raising awareness. She is, you know, building healing and safety for our women and girls. Family may cherish whatever legacy Ashley's disappearance is currently leaving behind, but they will always want her home safe, no matter what that takes or if they have to do it themselves. Resilience is evident in the Loring family, whose insistence that they will never give up on finding Ashley drives them forward. Ashley's grandmother, Loxie Loring, says in the days following her disappearance, she barely left the house, staying by the phone, hoping Ashley would call. And as for Kimberly, who misses her sister dearly, she says she has hope that if her sister could hear her, she would say this. I would tell her, I love you, sister, and I'm still looking for you, and now we're here, and, we'll, and we won't ever stop looking for you, and we'll find you, because our love is so strong, and we're not going to stop. She also said, I don't want to be an 80-year-old woman searching these mountains with my grandchildren, but there's no choice, because if I give up, who's going to look for her? The worst part for Kimberly is knowing that someone in her community likely knows something vital to the case, but has so far remained silent. Ashley Mariah Loring Heavy Runner was 20 years old when she disappeared in June 2017 from the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. There is currently a $10,000 reward for information on her case. At the time she went missing, she was 5 feet 2 inches tall, about 90 to 106 pounds with brown hair and eyes, and was possibly wearing a gray Roxy sweater and jeans. She is a Native American female of Blackfeet descent, has pierced ears, and would be 22 years old if alive today. If you have any information concerning Ashley's disappearance, please contact Blackfeet Law Enforcement at 406-338-4000. Hey guys, um, sorry, I'm out of breath. I was in the final stages of filming and scripting this video, and I went to double check something and found this. Human remains found last week on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation have now been recovered and sent to the FBI laboratory in Virginia for analysis. As the reporter states, the remains are at the FBI headquarters and spokesperson Barker said updates will be, quote, forthcoming as the analysis is ongoing. We have no idea if the remains are linked to Ashley's case or not at this point. So while I can't update the video further than 
well when it's released when you're saying this, I will keep an eye on news about this case, and I will link any update articles in the description if there's developments in the next couple of weeks. If it takes longer than that, which sometimes it does, sometimes DNA can take months, um, I'll be sure to update you down the line in a video. Um, Sometimes DNA can even take years, but hopefully we will have answers soon concerning these remains. Uh, and again, right now they have no reason to believe that it's connected to Ashley or they haven't said it is. And my thoughts are with the family right now. I'm sure waiting for updates on this, um, this new report is agonizing. As always, a special thanks to the Patreon family who are listed over to the left. Thank you for allowing me to cover Ashley's case for November um, in place of your poll and for financially supporting the channel's mission to spread awareness for these cold cases in light of most new dark matters and nameless episodes being demonetized by YouTube, which I believe included the last episode we did of Nameless. I think it was demonetized. Also, patrons, please check the last Patreon blog post from November 30th concerning what I mentioned at the very end of the video. You have a different code. If you want to join the Patreon family and have access to our private Discord and monthly live stream and blog post, information is always in the description, but again, I want to emphasize, even if you only continue to support by watching and supporting the cause and listening to these stories of the missing and injustice, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Specifically today for giving Ashley's case and the larger issue at hand a moment of your time. Um, a special thanks to Sharon Cohen and the other writers of AP's news article series on missing and murdered Native women, and the policymakers trying to enact change. And I want to say to the Loring family, and especially to Kimberly, if they happen across this video, I doubt they ever will, but just to emphasize to anyone who actually knows Ashley or is involved directly, Ashley is so important not only as the face of this movement, but as a person, as an individual, um, as a sister, a daughter, a granddaughter, and friend. And I hope there's a happy ending in the near future, or at the very least, answers for all of you who are personally suffering from her absence. I can't even imagine what you are going through and what you're up against in terms of reservation law enforcement and justice systems. I didn't know Ashley, but I can say that if she's anything like Kimberly seems, I hope that extraordinarily strong, loyal, and loving soul returns home to you all soon. Um, I encourage all of you to sign the petition Kimberly has set up. It's asking to establish a group of community-based first responders to begin investigating at the onset of someone's disappearance, instead of when it's too late to gather vital information. Also, the petition is requesting a new investigative team for Ashley's case. The link is in the description below, and they only need a couple thousand more signatures to forward it, so if you can just give a few more moments of your time to sign your name, that would be appreciated. And who knows, maybe it will make a difference in Ashley's case or in the overall issue. Um, if you live in Montana, the surrounding states, or Canadian territory, please share the video and the petition on your social media pages. Maybe someone who knows something will find the heart to finally come forward. And remember, though these are dark matters, the darkness always matters. Just a heads up, you can use the code DARKLING18 in the merch store through February 1st for 20% off of your order. If you want the new limited edition Darkling shirts or any other design for yourself or as a late holiday gift, now is the time to do that. Link is in the description. Please stay safe, friends, and have a good night.